Okay, why don't we uh, settle in, if, if everybody could please, and quiet down a little bit. Um, so today it's really a, a, a real pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor uh, Payam Hadari from uh, UC Irvine. He's a professor of electrical engineering there. And uh, I think a couple notable things, he, he has a huge bio with many awards that uh, would eat into his talk if I tried to describe some of them. Um, but I'll just say a couple of things. Uh, one of the remarkable things that I think he's, he's really accomplished in his years at UC Irvine is he was the first circuits person there. So he went in, he developed this program at UC Irvine, which is now has an international reputation. That's very difficult to do. Uh, an IC program, we were talking about it this morning, it's very difficult to get that momentum and all the fabrication of the chips and building boards and, and getting momentum in that area. And he's done a remarkable job. Uh, and his bio, if you read it, will indicate uh, the level of his success, which is uh, phenomenal. Um, but with respect to this presentation, this is a joint presentation between uh, the ECE Colloquium and the Solid State Circuit Society and the Circuits and Systems Society uh, local chapter. So we're doing these joint uh, presentations. And uh, I will just uh, introduce Professor Hadari. He is a, a distinguished lecturer for the Microwave Theory and Techniques Society. Uh, and he's a past uh, distinguished lecturer of the Solid State Circuit Society. And today he's going to talk about really, you know, sort of a cutting edge area, which is very high frequency communication with the evolution of 5G. People are looking to go to higher frequency, higher carrier frequencies to deliver um, you know, projected data rates that uh, consumers and uh, in many applications are demanding. So above 20, 30 gigahertz, all the way up to 100 gigahertz. And that's really what his talk will focus on today, um, high data rate communication in the millimeter wave band. So with that said, I will turn it over to Professor Hadari. Thank you very much, Chris. Good morning, everyone. And so this, uh, in this lecture, uh, I will uh, like to. Uh, I would like to make a, a strong case about uh, some of the fundamental design barriers that exist in designing uh, an end-to-end -end ultra high data rate uh, transceivers. And uh, in this presentation, I just uh, try to motivate uh, uh, some of the activities behind these uh, high frequency, high data rate transceivers. And I'm not going to spend time going through the circuit details. Uh, this is just an introduction, and hopefully it would be a motivational and a stimulating uh, conversation between me and uh, the audience. Uh, so, but before uh, kind of detailing why uh, there, is such there are such barriers uh, in designing the end-to-end uh, ultra high data rate uh, transceivers, I would like to kind of make a strong case in favor of uh, the need to go toward higher data rates. And when I say high data rates, I'm looking at, we are looking at data rates um, above and beyond uh, 20 gigabit per second, uh, all the way up to 100 gigabit per second wirelessly. So you will be amazed that there is this kind of uh, capability that wireless transceivers may uh, exhibit that allow these transceivers to achieve uh, data rates as high as 100 gigabit per second. But the question is, uh, can conventional transceiver architectures achieve this speed? And uh, in this presentation, I make a strong case that uh, you know the conventional transceiver architectures are fundamentally incapable of uh, achieving these uh, high data rates. But before that, uh, there are some general trends that point to the need, fundamental need for and demand for high data rates. Uh, um, so global forces in advancing communication technology, uh, first and foremost, is world population. And shown in this graph is uh, kind of uh, showing the uh, growth of the population uh, in, with respect to the year. And you will see that, you know, uh, uh, good news or bad news, uh, on to, uh, along the 20, uh, the 20, 2100, you see this kind of uh, sublinear growth of uh, world population, which basically translate directly to the uh, communication users. Uh, so uh, these communication users need uh, bandwidth, need data, and need to kind of exchange information. So this is one of the uh, kind of driving forces. Um, the driving, another driving force for this advanced uh, communication uh, technology or high, uh, data rate communication is that uh, not only we have this growing world population, but also users uh, constantly 
increasing demand for larger multimedia content, this really arising, uh, is arising from the fact that we have new applications. And these new applications uh, turn out to be more content intensive, uh, leading to, as I said, uh, this uh, demand for high data rates. And just as an example, if the past can show us some kind of, uh, give us some clue about the future, I would like to perhaps show two uh, kind of uh, important electronic gadgets that uh, have uh, experienced huge amount of uh, advances. Uh, looking at TV during the past 60 years, the TV industry uh, make it, uh, made a huge progress in terms of developing high definition TVs that we see here. And uh, even uh, more dramatic is the, uh, the advances in cell phone technology. So back in like early 1990s, mid 1990s, uh, we had the cell phone at this size, which is just a means for voice communication. And then uh, now we are looking at really um, mini computers and network processors, uh, which is capable of doing all these kind of multimedia content processing. So if this is this kind of huge demand, hopefully uh, by, by users to have high data rates, uh, we would like to see what can uh, a theory, uh, a fundamental theory, uh, introduce and what kind of possibilities we can have uh, by looking at the fundamental theory behind all of these activities. And I would like to go back and look at this uh, uh, very important yet very simple uh, intuitive channel theory. And according to channel theory, the capacity, the channel capacity is directly proportional to bandwidth and is logarithmically proportional to the signal to noise ratio. Now, in a layman language, what it means here is that uh, uh, simply the wider the bandwidth, the higher the capacity. So if this is this intention and uh, to increase the data rate, uh, the most straightforward solution is perhaps to dedicate a wider bandwidth for each user. Now, the uh, question is, if this is such a straightforward solution, uh, why we keep just increasing the bandwidth and dedicate bandwidth to each user? Why, rather than having like 10 megahertz, 20 megahertz bandwidth per user, as it goes in LTE, we have like, let's say, one gigahertz bandwidth dedicated for each user? What are the challenges? And can higher data rate only be achieved by increasing the bandwidth? In order to answer this question, uh, so I would like to first go through, uh, and uh, this is really perhaps the most uh, the kind of sophisticated slide that I have here. All the other slides are very really kind of, as I said, uh, easy to follow. So shown here is uh, really uh, kind of two uh, widely used transceiver architectures, uh, a zero IF transceiver architecture and uh, so-called low IF transceiver architectures. And I would like to discuss briefly what are the uh, challenges uh, uh, in designing, redesigning these transceivers for wider bandwidth. So uh, on the left side, you will see the zero IF transmitter on, uh, above and zero IF receiver on the bottom. And uh, for the zero IF trans uh, transmitter and receiver, and in fact, you can say the same thing for low IF and uh, receiver and transmitter. Uh, on the transmit side, we see obviously the mixed signal and digital side, uh, digital side and mixed signal side, the data comes in and it is uh, fed to two digital to analog converters, one I, the other one Q, uh, in phase and quadrature, and then the signals after being uh, translated to analog domain, then they will be up-converted. Why do, I, do we up-convert? Because we want to make sure that the antenna size is very small. Uh, rather than having the antenna of size of very big uh, size, you, can, uh, you would like to have a manageable antenna size. And that's the reason that you know, uh, we increase the carrier frequency and shift the carrier frequency to RF frequency. And then we have the power amplifier. Uh, and then we have uh, the signal ready to be transmitted by the transmit antenna. On the receive side, uh, once the signal is received, since it's weak, it is fed to the uh, low noise amplifier, then it will be uh, down converted by the so-called quadrature down conversion uh, architecture. Uh, then uh, the signal is transferred back to the digital domain by this A to D converters. We call it baseband A to D converters. And the low IF architectures is uh, almost about the same. We have also partition, we can identify or partition the whole system on a chip uh, transmitter receiver into the uh, front end part, uh, modem part, and the baseband part. So, uh, if that's the case, so these are really kind of widely used uh, transceiver transi transi architectures that you can, if you reverse engineer your cell phone, perhaps uh, on the transmit radio side, you can see kind of a version of these uh, uh, transceiver transi transi architectures. But now, if we want to redesign these uh, transceiver architectures for higher frequencies, uh, what are the challenges? Uh, first of all, this uh, so-called transmitter and receiver radio frequency chain must satisfy 
uh, a target performance uh, over a wide range of bandwidth. On the transmit side, we need to maintain high gain, high transmit power and efficiency, high linearity, and low error vector magnitude. Error vector magnitude is an indication of how good that uh, uh, modulated signal trans transfer to the RF frequency is. And on the receive side, we need to maintain low receiver sensitivity, low noise and high gain, and also higher, very high blocker tolerance because we have all these interference, interfering signals um, the, which, our, uh, uh, which our gadget, uh, the cell phone gadget is receiving and we want to make sure that the cell phone is still working uh, with a robust performance, very good performance in the presence of these uh, interfering signals. But uh, keep, in keep in mind that all these performance parameters need to be maintained over a wide bandwidth. Therefore, uh, the kind of uh, uh, conclusion that one can make is that it, it is very difficult to maintain high performance over wider bandwidth. And the reason is basically uh, stemming from the basic fundamental physics. If you increase the bandwidth, then what happens is that then you have to allocate and accommodate more noise over a wider bandwidth. It leads to the in, uh, like wider and higher in-band noise integration, which directly lowers the signal-to-noise ratio. The second uh, physics-related fundamental problem is that all these, at the end of the day, uh, these transceiver architectures are implemented using some active devices, like CMOS transistors. A MOS transistor, a MOS device, uh, unfortunately, exhibits frequency-dependent characteristics and nonlinearity. And this means that uh, not only we have distortion, but also this, this distortion is frequency dependent. So you can imagine that rather than having a narrow band uh, transmitter and receiver, if you have a, a, in vision a wide band transmitter and receiver, then this distortion exists and is frequency dependent. So what people have done uh, is this kind of marvelous uh, kind of invention that leads to a uh, kind of cap uh, possibility of designing high data rate transmitter receiver, but over a smaller bandwidth. And what is that? We can achieve a high data rate over a smaller bandwidth by using this kind of uh, employing the modu uh, digital modulation in modulation. And uh, basically, the job of the digital modulation, as, all, as we all know, involves transforming the binary bits to digital switching of a signal uh, attribute. This signal attribute could be amplitude, which leads to on-off keying, and the switching time is done almost, uh, where the switching time is, uh, we call it TB. We have also, if the uh, uh, transformation of the uh, binary bits to the dig digital switching of the signal attribute, the signal attribute is in phase, then uh, that results in a phase shifting, where the uh, modulation is constant amplitude, or it could be a frequency shift shifting, which is, again, another alternative constant amplitude modulation. Now, uh, also remember that for our uh, transceiver architectures, at the end of the day, we need to digitize the signal uh, in the digital domain. So what it means here is that uh, we have to have, obviously, data converters, and the sampling rate of the data converter, according to the Nyquist uh, theorem, and uh, perhaps you know that, uh, is that you, know, you have to satisfy some uh, relationship, namely the frequency, uh, the sampling frequency is at least twice the bandwidth in order to have unambiguous reconstruction of the signal uh, from the digital domain to analog domain. And uh, what it means here is that then, when it comes to trans uh, the direct conversion architecture, uh, the baud rate, uh, the, uh, the amount of the sampling rate is twice the baud rate. And the situation in low IF architecture is a little bit worse. Uh, it is easily proven that, uh, in fact, the sampling rate uh, should be uh, at least four times the baud rate. So what does it mean? Uh, so let's uh, go to an example to kind of clarify this point. For an OK modulation, which is a basic modulation, to achieve a 10 megabits per second data rate, the single sideband baseband bandwidth should be 10 megahertz. And the radio frequency bandwidth should be 20 megahertz. So what it means here is that if uh, I want to increase the data rate to one gigabit per second, then I have to spend 20 gigahertz of uh, RF bandwidth. Something that is very challenging and not really very desirable, right? So what it means here, so the conclusion here is that the so-called basic binary modulation schemes are not very uh, spectrally efficient. And that raises two questions. Question number one, how can we 
uh, kind of uh, address this fundamental issue regarding this uh, basic modulation techniques. Obviously, uh, the uh, kind of idea behind this higher order modulation is that how, how, come, uh, how about defining a symbol represented by multi-bit binary code? And how about using both amplitude and phase in order to generate this multi-bit binary code? And that leads to this kind of uh, uh, construction of higher, the so-called higher order modulations. Uh, starting with the BPSK, where the per modulation uh, constellation point we spend just one bit, going to the so-called QPSK, where each modulation point within the constellation is uh, employing two bits, two bit binary streams. And then going to uh, 8PSK, where we have uh, eight constellation points in the uh, modulation complex domain, and then we uh, spend like three bit binary codes. And then we can, these, these are all constant amplitude modulations. As I said, uh, you know, we can be a little bit more innovative and uh, uh, not only use the amplitude, but also the phase. And if that's the case, then we can uh, come up with all this higher order quadrature amplitude modulation. Shown here is one example, a 16 quam, where we have 16 constellation points, and each point is uh, uh, identified by a four bit binary code. So you can imagine that then, uh, obviously, like uh, compare 16 quam or 64 quam, compare it with a basic BPSK, uh, we can have, we can uh, transmit or transfer in general uh, more bits uh, per uh, a given instance of time. So this is a welcoming news. Increasing modulation complexity or modulation order results in more spectrally efficient communication. Now, what we can achieve here is that we can in fact have more bang for the buck, broad, namely broadcasting larger content over a, gain, a given bandwidth. The question, the next question that uh, naturally arises is that if you wanna, uh, if you're thinking about designing a 20 gigabit per second transceiver, 50 gigabit per second wireless transceiver, 100 gigabit per second wireless transceiver. Something that, you know, it is quite desirable, replacing this uh, uh, fiber optic transmitter receiver rather than digging the uh, uh, ground and then use all this wire, use this high data rate uh, communication in uh, wireless domain. If uh, high order modulation is so effective, uh, why can't we keep increasing the modulation order? Uh, thinking about 1K quam, 2K quam, Think, thinking about like 16K qualm. And uh, what are the fundamental barriers behind this? So, of course, increasing the modulation order means uh, a higher uh, spectral efficiency, which is good. But there are some challenges. In fact, increasing the modulation order requires a number of uh, challenges that at high frequencies become much more fundamental roadblocks that can, uh, that this prevent us from kind of designing all these conventional, using this uh, uh, conventional transmitter and receiver architectures for higher frequencies. Let's go through some of these uh, uh, challenges. Uh, first of all, if, as we increase the modulation order, uh, remember that this, the so-called Euclidean distance between the uh, adjacent modulation uh, schemes and modulation points will become smaller and smaller. Look at this. So what it means here is that if you have some kind of blurring effect on each modulation, on each uh, uh, modulation point, then you will lose the clarity, right? It means that then you may have some kind of ambiguity in terms of the uh, correct signal detection. Uh, in terms of the circuit design, uh, this kind of blurring effect is really generated by this, uh, um, is responsible for uh, the main response, the, the main culprit behind this kind of blurring effect is the local oscillator phase noise. And needless to say that, the, that as we increase the uh, modulation order, then we have to design uh, local oscillators with much lower phase noise. And it's very challenging as we increase the uh, oscillation frequency. Also, uh, higher modulation order uh, means uh, higher resolution data converters. Because at the end of the day, we have to have data converters that can handle a very good signal to noise ratio compared, uh, compared uh, the data converter that is used to handle this with this. Uh, and uh, not only the peak to average power ratio is increasing, dynamic range will increase with the modulation order, but also the resolution of the data converter. So, what it, uh, so the message here is that uh, if I wanna uh, increase the data rate, increasing a modulation order has some limitation. 
we basically hit the brick wall, if you will, in terms of increasing the modulation order. The message here is that one observation here is that it's extremely difficult to increase the modulation order beyond 1K quant for high frequencies. Obviously, you hear about, um, so there are some comp the companies, um, uh, uh, so like for example, Max Linear gave a presentation uh, recently they uh, kind of reported uh, 4K QAM uh, at uh, RF frequencies. 4K QAM at RF frequencies around 5 gigahertz is, uh, despite the fact it's challenging, but it's quite possible. But if you increase the frequency rather than 5 gigahertz, you think about like 60 gigahertz, 100 gigahertz, then uh, achieving or implementing that uh, 4K QAM modulation scheme is very difficult and uh, nearly impossible. So, uh, then, uh, you know, one can think about uh, using another trick in order to increase the capacity. And in order to kind of uh, improve the capacity, one, can, uh, one, can, uh, one idea is to basically use higher order carrier frequency. Um, but uh, the fact of the matter here is that the RF band from, let's say, 700 megahertz all the way to 6 gigahertz is heavily congested. And that doesn't allow us to do any kind of innovation when it comes to uh, increase, uh, designing a wideband uh, transmit and receive architecture. So question, how can we further increase the data rate for imaging data intensive applications and how about increasing the carrier frequency? And uh, this slide shows a number of kind of interesting um, advantages perhaps uh, of increasing carrier frequency. First of all, um, Increasing carrier frequency toward the so-called millimeter wave frequency, perhaps you have uh, uh, kind of come across this uh, terminology, millimeter wave frequency, uh, particularly uh, in conjunction with 5G standard. Uh, increasing carrier frequency toward the millimeter wave frequency range uh, will give us wider bandwidth with uh, a, smaller fractional, uh, a smaller fractional bandwidth. What does it mean? It means that let's assume that you know uh, I have uh, an RF signal and I, uh, with a 6 gigahertz bandwidth. If I use a 10 gigahertz carrier frequency to transmit this signal, 6 gigahertz over 10 gigahertz means that you have like say, you need to have like 60 percent of fractional bandwidth, and you need to design transmitter and receiver that can handle the 60 percent of the fractional bandwidth. Very difficult. Rather than uh, increasing the carrier frequency to let's say 200 gigahertz, it's just an example. Now that six gigahertz bandwidth is no longer uh, 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 considered to be huge amount of fractional bandwidth, right? It is really a small portion, like around 2%, right? So that's one advantage. Uh, another advantage which is not really kind of, uh, perhaps uh, it cannot be seen firsthand, but if you dig into the circuit design, you will see it, is that uh, obviously as we increase the frequency, carrier frequency, the passive sizes uh, the, will decrease proportionally. The footprint of the antenna being used, not only antenna size, but also the antenna spacing will decrease dramatically. And a welcoming news here is that if the antennas are smaller and smaller, then we can think about not only designing a single antenna transmitter receiver, but uh, thinking about multi-antenna transmitter receiver design. And there are some advantages of using this multi-antenna uh, transceiver architectures. Uh, just to show you an example shown here is uh, on-chip dipole antennas. These two are two antennas operating at 200 gigahertz with a spacing of 800, only 820 micron. So going to about higher frequencies brings forth this possibility of bringing the antennas on chip. Of course, the on-chip ant on -chip antennas are not very uh, highly efficient, high gain, but uh, again, uh, there is this possibility if there are some applications that require uh, uh, highly integrated transmitter receiver with on-chip antennas, then to what, uh, going toward higher frequencies uh, make these antenna sizes smaller and smaller, and as a result, you can think about putting all these de uh, passive devices on a smaller footprint, uh, chip footprint. And also talking about the multi-antenna architectures, uh, we can think about designing and uh, having an all analog phase array with electrical beam steering. Uh, so this notion of uh, being able to steer the beam electronically rather than manually is a welcoming news and uh, uh, using and designing this multi-antenna, many antenna uh, transmitter receiver chain uh, create that possibility. And also we can go all the way to uh, the so-called all digital multiple input, multi multiple output multiplexing system uh, where not only you can do digital beam steering or electrical beam steering, but also you can think about multi-user services. 
and uh, the so-called special multiplexing that gives us uh, better diversity and multi-user uh, services. So these are all these possibilities as a result of going toward higher frequencies and uh, employing more antennas on a smaller footprint. So um, then when it comes to thinking about designing high data rate transmitter and receiver architectures, uh, two opportunities, as we discussed so far, uh, can be uh, taken advantage of in order to achieve that uh, higher data rate. First of all, uh, we can think about wider instantaneous bandwidth. But we also uh, mentioned that increasing the bandwidth uh, is, has its own challenges. And the second notion is uh, to employ higher order modulation. Rather than using low spectral efficiency modulation such as OOK, BPSK, QPSK, ASK, we use a high complexity modulation. Thinking about 8PSK, 16 quam, 64 quam, 256 quam that give us, like, as I said, um, more spectral efficiency. But what are the bottlenecks? So when it comes to the bandwidth and the availability of bandwidth, let's just take a look at the technology. And uh, uh, let's see what uh, uh, the current technology can provide us with. Uh, so there is no question that uh, if we go toward, uh, if we kind of uh, increase the carrier frequency uh, to higher frequencies, uh, the fractional bandwidth gets smaller. But there is also another challenge in increasing the higher frequencies. Uh, the active devices, which are really the basic building blocks enabling uh, this power gain, uh, oscillation, and uh, also kind of all this processing, they uh, there is this uh, higher frequ highest frequency or high frequency operation. And beyond this high frequency operation, which we call Fmax, uh, the active devices cannot provide sufficient gain. In other words, uh, if we look at the relationship of the active devices performance with frequency, we will see that the power gain gets lower with frequency. The noise figure, which is a very good indication of how uh, low noise a device is, gets higher. And uh, the, in order to achieve, in, for a power amplifier, for example, to uh, be able to transmit high power, you need to burn more power, uh, which indicates very, very low efficiency, power efficiency. So all of these um, problems point to the fact that we cannot really increase the uh, carrier frequency to whatever frequency we want. There is a maximum operation frequency, Fmax, which is really kind of uh, uh, given by the technology and limitation of the uh, device fabrication. And if you look at the commercially available silicon technologies, the Fmax is really not that high. It's uh, varying between 250 to around 400 gigahertz. And in order to achieve sufficient amount of gain and performance uh, out of the device, you cannot go all the way to Fmax. Perhaps a good rule of thumb would be a staying below Fmax over three or Fmax over two. So if, for example, Fmax is 400 gigahertz, then frequencies around 90 to 170 gigahertz or 200 gigahertz at most would be a viable uh, frequency of operation um, or operation frequency uh, candidate to uh, design this high frequency transmitter receiver architecture. So we have some limitations in terms of the maximum frequency. But also, remember that I mentioned that conventional zero IF and low IF architectures have some limitations. Now I would like to kind of dig into this one level deeper, going one level deeper, and explain what are really the challenges uh, when it comes to the conventional zero or low IF transceiver architectures. So there are two major challenges. First, they are incapable of addressing unresolved challenges in baseband and mixed signal parts. What are those challenges? I will go through them. And also, most, uh, more specifically, when it comes to the implementation of these uh, uh, so-called end-to-end, fully integrated transmitter receiver architectures, uh, there is this need of very power-hungry, high-speed, high-resolution ADCs. Now, let me tell you what people in my community, so this circuit uh, uh, society uh, and microwave society are uh, advertising right now. Uh, so when, we, when they talk about high data rate transmitter receiver architectures, unfortunately, 
they don't really they, uh, stay silent when it comes to the implementation of the mixed signal part. So we have seen, like for example, if you look at the uh, International Solid State Circuit Conference paper or General Solid State Circuit papers, you, uh, definitely you see like a 300 gigahertz, 100 gigabit per second transmitter uh, by uh, groups from Japan. You have seen like uh, 50 gigabit per second transmitter receivers coming from like some European universities. But let me tell you what is inside them. What, is, uh, the, what they are advertising is just this part, just the front end part. And the front end is difficult. The designing a front end operating at 100 gigahertz is difficult, but it is not the whole story. The whole story, in fact, is even more important story is how can we integrate, design and integrate that data converter and the digital part as part of the system. What they do here is that when it comes to the digitization part, they get the data and pass it to this very expensive multi-watt real-time oscilloscope, $400,000 of oscilloscope. And you know how heavy it is? So, uh, and you know, when I, uh, when I talk about the transmitter, I cannot really put that uh, oscilloscope on my back and then with my chip and say that, you know what, this is my system. Obviously, uh, you know, uh, when we talk about like fully integrated, we have to think about how we can address the challenge of uh, designing this extremely high sampling rate uh, data converters. That also, the situation for low IF receiver is even worse because as you remember, I mentioned that the sampling rate required for ADC is four times the baud rate. So there are some solutions when it comes to addressing the ADC and data converter problem. They, I call it ADC less receivers, but unfortunately they are limited to basic modulations. Okay, and QPSK, I will go through this. And for ultra high speed, uh, obviously, we need, we need to have much higher, uh, better complexity, better higher order modulation. So these uh, uh, highly inefficient modulation schemes are not really enough for us to achieve the data rates that we are seeking or we are targeting. Namely, as I said, 20 gigabit per second and above. When it comes to the transmitter situation, uh, the, the, the same argument. So the, for the transmitter, what prior art, uh, prior art is advertising is just the front end. They are completely silent when it comes to the implementation of the D2A converter. They rather use this really expensive um, arbitrary waveform generator in order to generate this higher order modulation scheme. And I hope you agree with me that you know, the challenge is, uh, when, when we talk about like 20 gigabit per second, 50 gigabit per second, the challenge is really how to generate that 16 quam, 64 quam modulation. And what they do is that, as I said, they use this uh, off-the-shelf, very expensive multibot uh, AWG in order to generate this modulation and then feed it through that front end. And you know, I can argue that I can just replace this with a simple wire. <laughs> generate the modulation, pass it through this simple wire, and then you know, uh, transmit it through the antenna. Of course, you don't uh, up-convert, but I'm just saying that designing the front end is, despite the fact it's challenging, but it's not the whole story. Again, the same thing. Uh, we have some DAC-less transmitters, but they are limited to uh, basic modulations. So when it comes to the high-speed transmitters and receivers, I would like to also uh, give you some numbers uh, to give you a perspective and intuition about what are the state of the art when it comes to the ADC and DAC design. So first of all, many of, many of these high-speed, high-resolution ADCs use this uh, time interleaving for high, high sampling rates. Uh, they are, uh, but there are lots of challenges. Uh, since they are using multiple channel, they have to uh, kind of overcome the inter-channel gain and timing mismatches. And in fact, the, um, so a very good uh, example of what has been achieved so far is a paper uh, published in ISSCC 2017 uh, by Broadcom where they achieved 64 gigasampers sample per second, only six enop, effective number of bits, but look at this, power dissipation is uh, one watt. So the technology down, uh, down the scaling unfortunately doesn't help much because uh, the, if you look at this graph, and this graph uh, we basically kind of took uh, Professor uh, Merman, uh, Stanford uh, professor's uh, uh, survey of ADCs, and we basically reinterpreted in a different uh, kind of uh, plot. Shown here is uh, basically uh, all these prior art ADCs that uh, has been demonstrated by in our conferences. And if you look at these uh, uh, ADCs, you will see that uh, apparently when it comes to the noise floor, there is a minimum noise floor for all these ADCs. And this noise floor is uh, 
proportion, is proportional to the signal to noise plus distortion ratio and the bandwidth. So it means that if I increase the bandwidth, the signal to noise plus distortion ratio or, or, or ENOB will be lowered. I cannot really increase the ENOB and the bandwidth or the sampling rate all at the same time. There is a limitation. Relative noise floor uh, is uh, saturated at around minus 160 dB per, uh, dB per, dB per hertz. Also, there is a study by uh, Professor Razavi, which will be published in ISCAS 2020, where he predicts that the poverty, this is also another issue. Uh, that's the reason I said moreover. There is also some uh, building blocks that are essential and their power, dissipi uh, power dissipation and contribution to the overall performance has been discounted, which is the use of the clock generators. At the end of the day, those data converters are synchronous blocks, and they have to employ some kind of clock generator. And according to this study, which we really published in present in ISCAS 2020, uh, it was predicted that power consumption of the clock generators for high-speed ADCs will be very significant. And in fact, that was uh, uh, when I had the conversation with Tim, I was very excited because this basically adds another angle to my argument. Let me give you an example. The lower bound of the power dissipation of a VCO with a quality factor of 10, this is a lower bound, within a phase lock loop fed by a 50 megahertz, I'm sorry, this is 50 megahertz crystal oscillator with a phase noise of minus 100 dBc per hertz for a six bit 50 gigasampere per second, look at this, ADC is around 1.7 watt. So the clock generator power dissipation cannot be discounted, cannot be ignored. So add to this is another two watts of power dissipation. So we are really looking at really a power heater <laughs> if you want to design that uh, very high speed ADC. And by the way, this ADC doesn't have a very good ENOP. Uh, and if you want to implement a 64 QAM, 256 QAM modulation, I will assure you that this ENOP is not enough. And you have to go and use higher resolution, such as 8 bit. So, so far, uh, I hope that I make a strong case that the design of integrated ultra-high-speed RF to bits and bits to RF transmitters and receivers using traditional architectures is nearly impossible and very power inefficient. So a paradigm shift is required, and what I am kind of uh, making a strong case in favor of uh, designing and implementing higher order modulations and demodulations directly in RF domain. We all talk about like all these kind of significant improvement and magic things that a digital implementation and digital world can bring along. But as we go toward higher speeds, the digital, the fully digital implementation has some fundamental problem. And I will show you that by basically, if we can find a way to efficiently implement this modulation demodulation, higher order modulation demodulation in RF domain, then we can have lots of benefits when it comes to the implementation of the mixed signal part, namely the data converter. So if such possibility exists, then it definitely removes the power hungry ADC and DAC. We end up having just one bit data converter rather than a, a high resolution A3 and DAT, uh, DAC for uh, these high data rate transmitter receivers. It relaxes the complexity of baseband unit, and also, if we can do that, we can achieve higher spectral efficiency at high frequencies. So this is really kind of the big message that I would like you to take away from this uh, lecture. Now, the question is, okay, yes, I made a claim, but do I have any proof to this, right? I claim that if such, high, such efficient implementation of the modulations in RF domain exist, then obviously there are lots of advantages. The next question is, can we really efficiently design high order modulation, demodulation RF domain? And in doing so, I would like to go to some of the uh, recently published works that uh, we had uh, in Journal of Statistics Circuit. Uh, three of them really are available. One of them is uh, published in November 2019, September 2019, and 2020. I spent good amount of time on this part, given the time. And then for these two, uh, these two papers, I just simply invite you to look at the, the papers. Uh, they're all available. By the way, this paper appeared in February 2020 issue of Journal of Statistics Circuits. 
Okay, so these are the three papers, uh, 170 gigahertz fundamental frequency direct RF HPSK modulation. The other one is high order QAM uh, direct modulation transmitter. And finally, we also uh, showcased uh, 115 to 135 gigahertz uh, HPSK receiver. So uh, starting with the prior work, OK, so OK is very simple. Uh, direct modulation OK is very simple. We did it like seven, eight years ago. Uh, uh, my group, uh, I believe that this was the first uh, fundamental frequency transmitter receiver designed above 120 gigahertz. Uh, fundamental frequency meaning that uh, as opposed to prior work where people use frequency multipliers in order to uh, increase the carrier frequency, I, we design everything at the fundamental frequency, at the carrier frequency. PA at 200 gigahertz, uh, and this is just OK by the way. We are using this uh, four antenna element here on the transmit side in order to do this a special power combining, improve and increase the power because uh, if you look at the uh, if you look at the 200 gigahertz, uh, 200 gigahertz PA, we did a good job of getting very good power out of the PA, but uh, despite uh, getting very good power, still the power is very low. And in order to further increase the transmit power, we use this special power combining. On the receive side, we just use a non-coherent uh, detection for the OK demodulation. Shown here is the chip uh, designed in 32 nanometer CMOS process. Uh, so at the time that we fabricated the chip was July 2011, and 32 nanometer SOI process by IBM was not really a very well matured technology. We had to characterize lots of devices uh, at that frequency. But nevertheless, we were able to achieve very good performance. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to uh, this number, EIRP, at the saturated power. We were able to achieve 15.2 dB if you compare to prior art at that point. Uh, this is just uh, significantly better. Um, not uh, surprisingly, because uh, as opposed to prior work, we just designed a fundamental frequency transmitter receiver. Buying the 200 gigahertz signal and then down convert. There is no down convert, yes. It's uh, just amplified. And then later on, Berkeley uh, did a very good job of, uh, in fact, a very nice job of designing a conventional direct modulation QPSK transmitter. And shown here is just an example. Uh, just an example. They basically leverage this notion that uh, when it comes to modulation, demodul up conversion, down conversion, we are using quadrature up conversion and down conversion anyways. So why not using this to basically, for the purpose of also generating QPSK modulation, which is the case, right? So what, we, what they, they did is that they did this, uh, it directly injected this beta stream into this uh, uh, quadrature of conversion mixers, and then uh, they not only did this quadrature of conversion, but also implemented the QPSK. Obviously, again, um, what happened is that, as I mentioned, this modulation uh, doesn't have a huge amount of spectral efficiency doesn't show a spectral efficiency. And therefore, uh, there is this great need, as I uh, kind of made a strong case, hopefully, uh, in this presentation, that we need to, in order to achieve higher data rates, we need to increase the modulation order. Now, I would like to, uh, uh, first of all, go fast, uh, very uh, briefly, uh, on this uh, paper that we just published in February 2020, uh, which is uh, demonstrating a millimeter wave bits to RF, RF 8PSK transmitter. The idea is very simple, and I don't uh, go through the details. Uh, consider a QPSK. If I can basically generate a pi over 4 QPSK and a QPSK, and this pi over 4 and uh, QPSK and QPSK can be switched back and forth by the third bit, then I'm done. I will be implementing and HPSK transmitter. And this is what exactly what we did, right? We have the QPSK, and then we, dis, uh, we use this three shovel phase shifter that can toggle between zero and 45 degrees, and then as a result, we can generate this HPSK. Obviously, putting the switch at, uh, inserting the RF switch at uh, 170 gigahertz directly in the transmit path is not good. So we transferred this in the LO side. So this is really the actual design. Uh, we uh, use the quadrature uh, uh, LO signal and we pass it through this switchable phase shifter and then this switchable phase shifter is controlled by the third bit and then we have these two bits and then we generate this HPSK. I'm not gonna spend time design, uh, going through the circuit design but this is really the case, yes. Yes, Chris. Um, do you have any concerns, these frequencies, I, I guess you don't have to worry too much about spectral emissions and uh, obviously those switches are gonna generate some spurs, right? That's, uh, that's, that's true, but again, uh, yes, that's true, but uh, there is no really a spectral mask per se at that frequency, but that is a legitimate concern. 
And what really want to, we wanted to showcase is that uh, we can efficiently generate that RF APSK. Yes. Um, does this have any implications on Nyquist filtering? Like, if I wanted to Nyquist filter, how do I go about doing that? So the question of pulse shaping and everything else, uh, the pulse shaping equalization, I'm not going to spend time because pulse shaping and equalization has been done in wireline domain. And you can just really reuse some of these techniques. The novelty, there are concerns, pulse shaping and equalization, but have been addressed before by prior work. So this is really kind of the bottleneck. Uh, the design is this. The fully RF to bit transmitter, bit to RF transmitter, and we designed this in, guess what? 65 nanometer CMOS process. With, uh, it's a two element antenna, uh, on chip antenna, and this is the design. We were able to achieve 20 gigabit per second data rate uh, out of this 8PSK. Now comes this interesting extension of this uh, direct modulation to higher order quantum modulation. And I would like to draw your attention to this presentation. I go through like very basic implementation and basic idea behind it. Uh, and I hope that you appreciate it. Very simple, by the way. Uh, you will be surprised if I share with you and you will uh, ask why other people have not really <laughs> thought about this. So for this uh, case study two, I'm going through a millimeter wave bit to RF, high order quantum transmitter using one bit DAC Enabling 20 gigabit per second data rate, uh, we can easily achieve 100 gigabit per second, by the way. Uh, the 20 gigabit per second because we basically designed that circuit for that particular data rate. So direct modulation with one bit interface. Very appealing, right? We, I said that, remember that clock generator for a high order ADC and data converter sh achieves around, requires around like two watts of power dissipation. ADC and DAC itself, consumes additional one or two bots. So it is highly desirable to really kind of let go of these three bots and come up with very power efficient techniques. And what we want to do is that we want to implement this high order modulator as part of the transmitter. What kind of possibility can it generate? We don't have to have a DAC because all these uh, inputs to these high order modulators are, guess what, bits. So we don't need really to have like a high order uh, DAC in order to implement that transmitter. But what is the idea? And this uh, slide goes through the idea. And the idea is very simple, by the way. I promise you that is, uh, the, there is no complexity. The idea is as follows. If I want to generate a 16 qualm, consider two QPS case. One of them is this, with a Euclidean distance between the adjacent points of 2D, and the other one is another QPS case with twice the Euclidean distance between the constellation points. And then add them in the vectorial domain, phasor domain. If you add them, it seems that you will, uh, easily, it, it can easily be proven that these points act like a point of gravity uh, moving this 8PSK, uh, 2PSK around four quadrants of the modulation plane. So you achieve 16 quam. No circuit, it's just uh, the fact. So QPSK2 defines the center in each quadrant of the 16 quam. QPSK1 adds on top of the, uh, to, on, on top of this to form a 16 quam symbol, the 16 quam symbols. And look at this. We have only constant amplitude signals that are added together to generate a highly complex modulation. Along the way, when we developed this idea, of, obviously like any other idea, we were kind of blind to other advantages of this uh, technique. Another advantage that I would like to share with you and you will be amazed is as follows. If you, uh, we basically did some analysis and the analysis is in our November 2019 issue of Journal of Solid Circuit. We look at the EVM of the 16 quam and it seems that the EVM of the 16 quam, it can be uh, proven is uh, dependent on the EVM of this QPSK and this QPSK. And assuming that the EVM of these two QPSKs, at the end of the day, they are just one QP, uh, the similar modulation, are the same, we can safely assume that, you will see that the EVM of 16 quam is equal to the EVM of QPSK. That is an amazing result. Why? Because achieving a low EVM QPSK at high frequency is much easier compared to achieving low EVM 16 quam or even higher or high order modulation at high frequencies. Yes. Does this assume co uh, lack of correlation between sources or sources of noise? Bits or bits. Bits or bits, right? Uh, so 
uh, whatever assumption that you have on the basic. So I don't do any kind of extra assumption as what is available now. So if you require four bit binary code, if they are uncorrelated, then they are uncorrelated here. And I guess they are, right? Because we are looking at the binary, binary stream, uh, binary code that basically implement that uh, high order modulation point. Or was he asking about the correlation of the noise added to the two modulators? The correlation of the noise added to the modulator, I will discuss it, that's a very good question. Uh, in general, this architecture is as good and even better than the uh, conventional transceiver architecture at high frequencies when it comes to noise and the phase noise. I will discuss that, this kind of intuitively in just a few minutes. Okay, extend to higher order modulation. Look at this. I can just simply add constant amplitude modulations to achieve higher order quam. In fact, three QPSKs can be combined together in order to achieve uh, a 64 quam modulation. Now, I would like to tell you that, you know, uh, of course, we are talking about higher frequencies, like uh, 100 gigahertz and above at very high data rates. I, I don't claim that this uh, modulation uh, beats the traditional digital implementation of higher order quam at RF frequencies, no. But this simple implementations and real, this simple operation is a welcoming news when it comes to higher frequency implementation of these modulation techniques at high frequencies. And then, as I said, along the way, we also discovered other advantages. Consider the uh, generation of the, 16, uh, the high order qualm in RF domain, the way that we, we do it, compared it to a traditional kind of uh, uh, qualm modulation implementation in digital domain. When it comes to digital domain, of course, we need to have a multi-bit DAC. And this multi-bit DAC, shown here, is the current string DAC. And the current string DAC, all these switches, unfortunately, need to be switched at the data rate, as opposed to a one bit DAC. All it takes for this to implement, let's go back, all it takes is just having some kind of DC multiplication of some value, such as current, by two. And you will see that uh, when it comes to the implementation of the transmitter, you will see it. And shown here is one example. Uh, a 16 qualm direct modulation, direct modulation transmitter, this is really a bits, bits to RF, anything. So uh, we have like four bits, we have the LO generation distribution network here. We get the external LO, we pass it through some uh, doubler in order to generate this uh, INQ, and then we generate another kind of INQ, and then feed it here, and then look at this, these tail currents of this quadrature mixer is used in order to generate the required uh, spacing between the uh, QPSK modulation. And then we combine them together and we pass it through uh, PA, and then we are able to generate this 16 quam. Now, your question about the phase noise can be answered here intuitively. So when it comes to uh, the traditional architectures, uh, of course, we are just using the same if we want to uh, implement like 100 gigahertz, 120 gigahertz LO, most likely that LO should, should be, uh, if we want to do it this way, we, we need to have a tripler, we need to have a doubler and what have you. And the only difference here is really kind of this uh, kind of uh, a splitting, right? Interestingly, this splitting mechanism really adds to the far out phase noise. It can easily be proven. Then uh, closing phase noise, which is really coming from the correlated part of the phase noise, is dominated by the LO. So what kind of message it uh, uh, kind of gives us? So when it, co when it comes to the closing phase noise component, it means that we have to deal with the same challenges that a conventional transmitter architecture, transceiver architecture is uh, dealing with. Namely, we have to design a low uh, phase noise, uh, closing phase noise frequency synthesizer. When it comes to the far out phase noise, the far out phase noise makes a uh, significantly lower contribution compared to the closing phase noise. And then, you know, this is really kind of the intuition behind it. And there is also a proof, which we, uh, kind of more rigorous proof that we had in the paper that shows that this is the case. So when it comes to the phase noise degradation, interesting, a phase noise degradation, particularly on the closing part, not a far out noise, is very insignificant. In, in fact, this is the same. We implemented this transmitter in a uh, silicon process. The reason that we use a SIG by CMOS, because uh, uh, as you guys know, everything in the university, when it comes to the university, everything is about price and about money. So this is really free fab, 
<laughs> and that's the reason that we use this uh, technology in order to implement that transmitter. And shown here is this RF to bits transmitter, including a, a low generation distribution, the QPSK modulators, and the forest HPA operating at 120 gigahertz. Yes. We did lots of uh, measurement, uh, wireless measurement, uh, uh, system characterization. Uh, wireless measurement involves measurement over uh, 20 and 30 centimeter distance, and the distance is really, I'm, I'm not sure if it's shown here. The DUT is here, the antenna for the receive side is here. So we are using this kind of vertical measurement, and you know, the distance is around like 20, 30 centimeter. We were not able to kind of go higher. As you can see, <laughs> there is something that is like a physical limitations uh, for our uh, setup, uh, but, um, we cannot really go much longer distance. Uh, the maximum distance we can go uh, is maybe 40 centimeter given the uh, power that we generated out of this transmitter. So shown here is the measurement, wireless measurement, out of the, uh, for two data rates, 16 gigabit per second, 20 gigabit per second. Shown here is the constellation and also the measured EVM. And if you look at the measured EVM for 16 gigabit per second for 16 qualm, is minus 16.7 dB at 20, uh, 120 gigahertz which is compared to QPSK one and two is not really, the degradation is not really that significant. When it comes to 20 gigabit, 20 gigabit per second, uh, also, you know, you can say that uh, the degradation is not really significant. Uh, I would like to kind of draw your attention to the fact that this is really the first generation transmitter. Uh, from the beginning to the end of the implementation, it took like around three or four months of massive work. So uh, we didn't really optimize this uh, transmitter. But, you know, we were able to achieve very good performance, nevertheless. And the uh, QPSK EVM with respect to the data rate, these are just kind of usual measurement that people uh, take in order to evaluate the EVM degradation with data rate. And not surprisingly for the 16 quantum QPSK, you will see that as we increase the data rate, obviously the EVM is uh, degraded. And shown here is a table of performance comparison. I don't want to spend much of the time on the uh, table of performance comparison. Um, so one highlight here is that obviously we are looking at uh, the input to our uh, chip is raw bits, the uh, kind of uh, PRBS, and we use a PRBS in order to uh, kind of introduce a testability. Whereas for other works, they are using the external AWG. And Obviously, it's not a fair comparison if you want to compare the power dissipation because the power dissipation of AWG could be around five to six watt. Now, I don't want to add six watt to these works because I do a disservice to this work if I add six, six watt, seven watt, because we don't really know what portion of the power is dedicated to the DAC. But you can, you can get the picture, right? So the power dissipation, if you add the ADC part of this and the clock generator is significantly higher than this. And look at our power dissipation. So we can argue that the power dissipation is order of magnitude lower. Order of magnitude lower compared to the prior work. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, uh, so what uh, I did today is uh, I basically walk you through, first of all, the uh, motivation behind the need for high data rates and wireless uh, communication high data rates. And also I made a strong point that the uh, conventional trans transceiver architectures, uh, direct in, uh, implementation of them at higher frequencies uh, faces, face fundamental challenges. And namely, the power dissipation of the ADC and DAC, if at all possible, if the implementation is possible, uh, and the clock generator power dissipation according to a uh, paper published by my colleague, Professor Razavi, the, the power dissipation is enormous. And therefore, we need to, we have to uh, do some innovation. And good news for uh, the class here is that uh, if you find good problems, obviously there are always room for innovation. And this is one of the, we were lucky to kind of find, to find that uh, particular problem. And uh, I showcase a number of case studies uh, that uh, make a strong case in favor of direct modulation and modulation in RF domain. Thank you very much. Any question? I have a question about extending this work up into the terahertz region. What is your, what's your feeling on that? I mean, there's a fundamental limit to the technology. Do you, I mean, terahertz, do you think it's a bit hyped up, and yes. particularly for communication yes. systems? Oh, good. Then I have another question for you after yes. that. Yes. Okay, terahertz good. communication, uh, despite the fact that we designed a 300 gigahertz frequency synthesizer, we, uh, but 
I agree with you 100%. Uh, I am not in favor of terrorist communication. Terrorist imaging and spectroscopy, there is a different story. But terrorist communication, why do you want to go to terahertz? If we can achieve 100 gigabit per second data rate at 100 gigahertz, 120 gigahertz, and then the path loss is uh, unavoidable at very high frequencies, why do I want to go to 300 gigahertz and above frequencies? There is no need. You can achieve, using some of these innovation, you can use a mixture of high frequency and high order modulation in order to achieve magnificent data rate. In fact, you can increase this data rate to one terabit per second by just uh, bundling. Very similar to like wire, uh, wire line. Uh, they have a basic wire line chain uh, of 50 gigabit per second, and then they use some kind of bundling. Of course, and in wireless, it's a little bit difficult. But again, it's possible when we look at the point-to-point -point communication. I'm, in, I'm not in favor of terrorist communication, and it's hyped up when it comes to the communication. I basically uh, kind of talk to a number of people, and there are some fundamental issues, not, uh, not only on the device, but also on the path loss and the physics of the propagation. So do you think the physics of the device, so you, you mentioned spectroscopy. I mean, you need power gain, yes. right? So I, you, you don't use CMOS. OK, but any compound Yeah, device. for example, indium phosphide uh, hemp technology, there is a device with an Fmax of 1 terahertz, 1.5 terahertz by north of Grumman. And they were able to achieve, uh, get very good power out of that device. So yes, if you want to uh, go to terahertz spectro spectroscopy and uh, imaging, you are, uh, your point is well taken. Getting power out of that device, CMOS device, is uh, kind of, uh, that is hopeless, is uh, effort. Do you think it's always hopeless? It will never scale to the point you can is it just the physics that will, will so, limit? So, first of all, uh, you know, the F max of uh, five nanometer CMOS process is around like f 350 gigahertz. So if you go by the Moore's law, the uh, maximum operation frequency is not a scale up. So we have no choice but to use this kind of heterogeneous integration mm. that involves the use of the indium phosphide uh, technology, which is the best um, possible uh, device uh, or technology to achieve high power at that frequency. So never, I don't say never, but you know, at least the Moore's law and the way that uh, applies to the MOS technology, uh, there is no hope to achieve like, uh, we, we get devices with uh, sufficiently good power that per your saying is practical. Of course, we are talking about, there are some papers, very good techniques coming out of academia, circuit techniques, and they are attractive because uh, people in uh, academia they found out that in RF domain, there are not much innovation in the circuit design. What they do is that uh, if you go to higher frequencies, you can use this uh, notion of electromagnetic and electronics holistically. You use electromagnetic theory or uh, antenna theory, propagation antenna theory, and the circuit design, and come up with all these kind of circuit techniques that leverage this uh, EM theory and the circuits. This is attractive in terms of publication, exactly. but practicality, Yes, there is no, and then if you want to have like more, uh, line up more array, increase the antenna size, antenna array, there is another problem, which is directivity. So, of course, uh, at very high frequencies, the antenna size is very small. You can think about designing a 500 element uh, array in order to increase the power, but guess what? The, narrow, the beam is so narrow that if you have a little bit of misalignment from the transmitter and receiver, you don't see anything. Uh, so this is another problem. So you know, uh, the problems are there, and that's the reason that you really kind of the motivation behind it, uh, if you think about it behind this work, is that, is that we stay at uh, high enough frequencies such that we accommodate the bandwidth. We rather use high order modulations, but uh, efficiently at high frequencies. So this is really, in my view, this is like really kind of the way to go. And uh, it is not the only way to go. Uh, I'm just, this presentation tries to kind of plant perhaps some seeds for your thought to uh, kind of appreciate the fact that perhaps system level innovation uh, is still alive and you can do lo lots of system level innovation. Okay, great. Uh, more questions? Yes. yes, KD, yeah. uh, loud. All right. Thank you, it is a very in interesting presentation. Thank you very so much. I have a question, so what about the ray RF demodulation for quantum signals? Is, is, is that something you are looking into? Was the question? It is the question, are you direct RF modulation of quantum uh, signals? The RF demodulation. Oh, direct oh, RF demodulation. 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 Okay. Excellent question. 
I didn't show uh, RFD modulation. I was a little worried there because I thought, okay, did yeah, you yeah. fall asleep during the talk? No, no. Direct RFD <laughs> modulation, that's a very good question. Uh, we are thinking about it uh, and we are uh, in the process of developing the RF, direct RFD modulation. Uh, is this operation reversible? As you can imagine, not really. But there are some effective techniques uh, to demodulate higher order quantum modulation without the need to have uh, ADC, high order ADC. But that's a well taken question. The question is that this uh, idea that we had, namely using QPSK constant amplitude modulation to generate high order modulation, is it reversible? Not really, not straightforward. But there are some ways, if you think about it, there are some innovation, innov innovative and creative ways of this uh, quantum modulation without the need of uh, four high order, uh, high, high resolution ADCs. Unfortunately, I cannot reveal it because you know, we are in the process of developing it right now. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. All right, good. Uh, any quick last minute questions? All right, let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you.